Good morning. As, uh, as Jason introduced this morning, I'm Jason as well. I'm Jason Thomas from our Pecola campus. I'm the student minister there. And a couple weeks ago, had the privilege to go to Falls Creek with a lot of your students and uh, a couple of mine as well. Just had a great time there. And so I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, that week for me was a time of encouragement. And what we've hoped with this series, Uncommon, that we've been in is that this would be a time of encouragement for you as well to, to live a life uncommonly. Um, and not to just mean uncommon in like a sense that's different, just to be different for the sake of being different, but a life that is uncommon in a way that presents the gospel to those around you. And so throughout these weeks, we've looked at different areas of what it looks like to be uncommon. Uh, a couple of those, we've looked at what it looks like to be uncommon in speech. We've looked at what it looks like to be uncommon in conduct and love. And last week, uh, Brandon was here, and he spoke with you about having uncommon faith. And today, I want to talk about uncommon purity. Uh, through this series, we've been looking at the words of Paul directed to his younger disciple, Timothy. And in these words, he encouraged Timothy to set an example to those around him. And so that's what we've been encouraging for all of you as well, to set an example to those around you as followers of Christ. In 1 Timothy 4.12, uh, it's been our focus verse for this series, and it's one that we're all probably pretty familiar by this point because every week we've tried to share this, uh, and I'm going to share it again. It says, let no one despise you for your youth. Again, this is Paul writing to Timothy. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So what is purity, that word. I, th I think if we went around this room, we took a survey, we would all probably fall on kind of the same general sense as to what purity was, right? Like you get this picture of cleanliness, you get something that's, you, you hear the word pure and you know like, okay, you can identify purity when you see it. Like something is pure, something is without blemish. It's like clean, cleanliness. One thing uh, for me that comes to mind when I think about purity is just like a newborn child. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, me and Emily, we got to go see uh, a close friend of ours. They had a, a child. And so we got to go see this baby and hold this newborn baby. And it's just impossible to see this, this just living being and look at it and not just think of purity, just something that's without blemish, something that doesn't know the troubles of the world, is just carefree as it just lays there sleeping. It's just impossible to not see purity in that moment. A quick Google search defined purity as freedom from adulteration or contamination. It also listed freedom from immorality, especially of a sexual nature. Now, when we think about areas in our life where we might try to pursue purity, sexual purity is the one that kind of sticks out. Like, it's, it's very easy to immediately think of sexual purity. Does anyone remember the, uh, the campaign that was uh, kind of sweeping the nation at one point? It was True Love Waits. Anybody remember that? Whenever I was in high school uh, going through youth group at my church, we did a, a True Love Wait series, and uh, they, every week we'd go and we'd talk about what it meant to uh, pursue purity, and we actually even signed pledges saying like, that we would keep things for marriage uh, in marriage, that we would uh, keep ourselves pure until then. I think part of the reason why sexual purity is the kind of purity that we think of when we hear purity is because it's one of life's greatest struggles as Christians grow up. Now, let's be honest with ourselves. The bar for sexual purity out in the world is pretty low, right? Like, there's not anything out in the world that's telling you to pursue cleanliness. It's not telling you to pursue purity. It's telling you, hey, these are your wild years. When you're a teen, when you're in college, these are your years to explore. These are your years to experiment. These are your years to do the things you want to do because later in life you can settle down. It's telling you, go do what you want to do now because you may not have that opportunity. Purity is the last thing that culture is telling you to pursue. Look at mainstream media. Look at sitcoms, the things that music and movies, all these things that the world is pushing. You're going to find depravity and corruption in every corner. Now, Ephesians 5.3 says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Other translations of this would say that there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. So we know what we have to do. We know that Paul is directing Timothy to go and set an example, and so we as followers of Christ should also be going forth and setting that example 
But the question is, how do we do that? How do we set an example of purity to those around us who don't have an example out in the world? How do we do that? In the midst of sin around every corner and temptation all throughout the world, how do we pursue purity? Now, it's, it's not enough to just refrain from committing sin. It's not enough just to not act. We have to also commit to inner purity. Luke 6, 45, it says, The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. What's on the outside, the actions that are being committed, the things that are being done, is a direct reflection of what's on the inside. Now, you might be able to hide it for a while, right? Like, it may not be immediately evident. You might be able to hide in the darkness for a while, but what is, on, what is in the dark will come out to light. So the question is, what are you being filled up with? What is consuming your time? What is consuming your mind? There are three areas where we can seek purity to help us live without even a hint of immorality. The first area where we can seek purity is uh, is by having pure hands. Your actions ought to be marked by purity. The things you do ought to be marked by purity. It's true that you're not to commit sexual sin, but just not sinning isn't enough. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't go out with the mission to not sin, right? Like, we know that that's not enough, but it's an important piece. You need to live in such a way that you are not expressing lust towards others around you, but instead expressing love to them. Stop looking at how people and, and others around you can serve you, but instead put your hands to work serving others. Show them the love of Jesus by serving them. There's a saying that says, idle hands are the devil's workshop. If you're not busy, get busy and go work for the kingdom. Get busy doing work for those around you. The second way to seek purity is to have a pure heart. As Luke showed us, the actions we take will be reflected by what's happening in our heart. Our heart is going to lead, guide, and direct what we're doing. Your longings eventually manifest themselves in your life. So you need to ensure that you're longing for what is right and what is good and what is pure and what is holy. In Matthew 5, 28, Jesus says that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So fill your heart with the holiness of God. Cling to his word and seek after him for guidance and correction. The third way to seek purity is to have a pure mind. You need to be careful about what you allow in your mind, what you see, what you hear, what you read. Paul wrote in Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Purity consists of pure actions, and actions are an evidence of purity, but it also consists of pure desires and pure thoughts. Charles Simeon, an evangelical in the 1700s, he said this, that every word and every look, yea, and every thought ought to be well guarded in order that Satan may not take advantage of us and that not even the breath of scandal may be raised against us. Not even a breath, or as Scripture would put it, not even a hint. Speaking of Ephesians 5 that I referenced earlier, I want to look at Ephesians 5. We're going to read quite a few verses here. We're going to really just let Scripture speak this morning, let Scripture talk, and uh, see what it has to say. So starting off in verse 1, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the world, or in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now when we go and and we look at Ephesians 5 and we really just begin to dissect everything here, we can get a good glimpse at what it means to be uncommon in purity. Let's look at verse 1 again. It says, Therefore, be imitators of God. This verse tells us how to walk in purity, be imitators of God. Verse 8 says that we once walked in darkness, but instead have been brought to the light of God. The things that were hidden in the dark have now been brought out to the light. Therefore, we ought to walk in the light as well. How can we walk in the light? How can we walk out in purity if we keep things in the dark, if we keep our sin in the dark? Bring those things to the light so that Christ can shine on you. Purity is about more than sexual purity. Like, we know that that's an aspect of it, but there's more to it than that. Sure, it may be the first thing that comes to mind, and it's something that's pretty easy to gauge. Like, you know if you're failing in that area or not, but it's not all there is to it. To truly seek purity, we need to seek the holiness of God. A chapter back in Ephesians 4, Paul speaks to us about the new life that we've been given. This is what he had to say in Ephesians 4, 17. It says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. So we as believers, we're no longer that old self. We have been made anew in Christ after the likeness of God. As a new creation, we need to strive to be like God, seeking his righteousness and his holiness. Now we know we'll never truly be like God, right? Like there's one God, he's set apart, he is so high and lifted up above us, but we need to be imitators of God, striving to be like him, seeking his righteousness and holiness. God's holiness is his defining characteristic. It's what truly sets him apart. It describes both his goodness and his power. His holiness is completely unique and completely powerful. His holiness is overwhelming. Think back to the story of Moses. God's holiness is so great and so powerful, it's so overwhelming, that even when Moses was in God's presence in the form of a bush, he was afraid. God warned him, take your feet off because you're, or take your shoes off because you're on holy ground and don't come too close or you'll perish. He hides his face and is afraid to look at God. See, Moses understood how great 
and how powerful the holiness of God is. Another example of just how overwhelmingly powerful the holiness of God is can be depicted, uh, can be found in the verses depicting the Holy of Holies, the inner room of the Israelite temple where God resided. The high priest, he alone would be allowed to pass the veil and, and come before God. But it wasn't before making sure he himself was pure, and it wasn't before he made sure he did all the rituals that were required of him. He had to be morally pure, but he also had to be ritually pure. They were not able to exist within such close proximity to God's holiness if there was even a hint of impurity among them. In Isaiah 6, the prophet writes about a vision he has about being in the midst of God. He described seeing the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. He described angelic beings there also in the presence of the Lord. And he recalls as they say the words, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, holy, holy. This repetition intensifies the words being said. God's holiness is absolute moral purity, and his holiness is set apart from all creation. Isaiah, he's then purified when one of the the angels, the seraphim, touches his mouth with a burning coal that had been taken from the altar, and they say to him, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. The prophet Ezekiel had a vision where the holiness of God pours out from the temple like a river. As it flows, it revitalizes and purifies all the land that it comes into contact with. All of these examples of God's holiness purifying impure things leads to Jesus. It leads to Christ. We as broken, sinful people could not enter the temple and stand in the presence of God on our own because our impurities would cause our immediate death. We needed someone to act on our behalf to take away our guilt and atone for our sin. We needed God to pour out his holiness on us in order to revitalize and purify us. Christ, who is God in the flesh, goes into the land, he heals the sick, he raises the dead, he casts out demons, and all of these miracles performed are examples of God's holiness being poured out and purifying the things it comes into contact with. Christ's blood was poured out for us so that our sins could be atoned for and the holiness of God could sweep over us, purifying us and making us a new creation. God's holiness must be treated with respect. And at the same time, it is a gift that has been given to us and that is able to heal a broken and impure world. As followers of Jesus Christ, our mission is to go and make disciples of all nations. Our mission is to spread the holiness of God to all the world. Merriam-Webster defines holy as religious or morally good exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. The Hebrew word for holy is kadesh, which comes from the root word kadash, which means to set apart for a specific purpose. If you are in Christ, if you would say that you've been made a new creation, if you say that you follow Jesus with your life, then you have been set apart for a specific purpose. You have uncommon purity because you have been made clean by a perfectly holy and righteous God. Seek after his will and commit to his understanding. Strive for pure hands that abstain from sin. Think of one area in your life where you struggle with sin. You know this is where you fail. And seek help in that. Confess that sin to someone. Have someone to make you accountable. Share with them. Let them pray with you. Put your idle hands to work, serving those around you. Strive for a pure heart that loves selflessly. Stop looking at how others can serve you, but instead look at how you can serve others and show them the love of Christ. Maybe you have a a brother or a sister who's just going through a hard time. They are just really going through life. Life is throwing them every obstacle it can think of, and they need someone to show them Jesus. Be that for them. Encourage them and lift them up. Lastly, strive For a pure head that thinks on things above. Keep your mind on God's word and meditate on his word daily. Set aside time to devote daily in scripture and in prayer. As I invite the band to come forward, I want to share a little story. Um, 
So a few months ago, OG&E, they came out to our house, and uh, there were some branches and limbs and things that were trying to make their way up into, or into their wires. And so they came out, and they cleared all this out. It wasn't a job I hired them for, uh, but it was one that needed to be done. I was like, okay, that's fine. And they did a good job. They got everything cleared out. The only issue was they, everything that they had cut off, they just kind of left where it dropped. And so it fell in like some bushes and different greenery and stuff. And I was like, okay, well, thanks, but no thanks. Like, I appreciate the work I now have to do because of what you did. Like, it needed to be done. So I was like, okay, I need to clear that out. Well, what happened was I just kind of ignored it for a while. Like, laziness took over, and I just didn't feel like messing with it. So I just kept putting it off, kept putting it off. Well, the other day, I was like, you know what? It's time. Today I feel more productive than ever in my life. I'm going to go out, and I'm going to clear these branches and just get rid of this eyesore. Because what it did was it made the rest of my yard work difficult because I had to kind of, like, make this huge circle around all of it, and it was just ugly and unmowed in that one area. And so I went out there, and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to clean it all up. But there was a problem. The longer those limbs sat there, the more those bushes and other greenery had grown up. And so now those limbs were so rooted in everything that no matter how much I pulled, they weren't budging. They weren't moving. It didn't matter what I wanted to do because I just let it take hold of that area. Some of you this morning have sin you need to deal with. You have sin that needs to be uprooted out of your life because the longer you let that sit there, the more it's going to take root and the harder it's going to be to deal with that. Now let me be clear, you can't deal with it on your own. You need a spiritual force to come in and wreck shop and do work in your life. You need Jesus to come and act on your behalf. That's the invitation this morning. If you have sin that you need rooted out, if you need to strive for pure hands, if you need to strive for a pure heart, if you need to strive for a pure head, make that your goal this morning, to to lay it all before Jesus. Find someone in your group, find someone you trust, pray with them, ask for their guidance, ask for their direction. I'm going to pray, and you guys will be uh, invited to stand with us in invitation. Father, we thank you for all you've done for us. God, we recognize our brokenness. We recognize the darkness that is in us without you. We recognize that we were without hope, but God, you made hope for us. You gave us a chance at life. You gave us a chance at purity. God, we thank you for Jesus that came and lived and died for us. God, I I pray that the people in this room, that they would strive for your purity. Not for the sake of being known as someone that's clean and pure, but for the sake of making Jesus known, not only here in this church, but across the county and across the nations. God, we thank you for all the ways you continue to show your goodness in our lives. And God, we just pray seeking your purity and your holiness. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys would stand.